Mary General, if I may ask you a question, uh, is it in the public interest that Parliament, or for that matter, a provincial assembly, remains within the limitations that may be placed by the constitution on Parliament or a provincial assembly? Is it in the public interest? My Lord, uh, which fundamental right would it not be affected? Not talking fundamental right. I'm talking of public interest. Of course. Of course. Yes. So therefore. <laughs> Again, happening which I must uh, sorry interject. I would, with you have agreed with now here. I won't agree with you. I will say it may be unconstitutional, but not within the parameters of 184.3. There may be a lot of unconstitutional things going on in Pakistan, but it won't come within the parameters of 184.3. That is a fundamental point. That's my way of approaching it. Uh, others have different of approaching it. So, I think if you are not going to do it, I just, this, this so part, I just general, If I may continue, sorry. If I may continue. It is in the public interest. I am not speaking of any fundamental right. I am only speaking of public interest. It is in the public interest you accept, and I think rightly so, that I, because we have a federal structure, parliament and provincial assemblies must remain constitutional limits. Right? Whatever those constitutional limits are. So therefore, it seems to me to follow logically that if parliament makes a law that is ultra vires or a provincial assembly makes a law that is ultra vires it is in the public interest to challenge that law. Because if remaining within the constitutional limits is in the public interest, then going beyond those limits and making an ultra vires is surely a breach of public interest. What would you say to that? That touches upon the legislative competence. No, no, I'm talking of public interest. Yes, yes, but, yes, no, no, but is any law, that, a law cannot be struck down interest. on the basis of just where, public interest. Where the challenge can be is a separate. Well, Lord, let's, let's just take a step back. Any law made by any legislature, provincial assemblies or the parliament, would be a matter of public interest and importance. It is a law being enacted. Now, in order to examine that law, in order to assume jurisdiction to examine that law, we have to look at, in the case of Supreme Court, an article, article 184, and the cases of High Court in 199. Now, you to note that you have to this challenge fails on both counts. Yes. Public interest and this. I am only looking at public interest. I mean, speaking for myself, it seems to me that any law which is ultra vires whether by parliament, whether by provincial assembly, meaning go breaches the limitations, whatever they may be imposed by the constitution, because the constitution is supreme. It is in the it is contrary to public interest. Has to be. Now, uh, I, I let me just uh, quickly address this because this is a maintainability issue here, and I want to address that issue here first and foremost. <coughs> The two conditions provided under Clause 3 or required under Clause 3 are connected. It has to be a matter of public importance with reference to enforcement of fundamental rights. Now, independently, any legislation, any statute, any rule or any regulation would be a matter of public importance or public interest for that matter. Now, in order for this court to assume jurisdiction, now this court does not assume jurisdiction under 184.3 on a legislature, on, on any law being enacted for want of legislative competence. It has to be <clears throat> ultra vires or violative of the rights, fundamental rights granted. So you say that the word relating to enforcement. With reference to the enforcement is, of that is the That you say is the buckle that connects the two things. That is the buckle that A connects the two and that is where it, it actually uh, uh, prevents, if I may say so, uh, this examine constitutionality of a statute on legislative competence. Is legislative competence not in the public interest? As I said, Your Ladyship, these are, this is something, legislative competence alone is something which can only be examined in 190. Is it not a, a right that everyone has under the Constitution well, well, that not, uh, laws legislative, are made in a particular way? Legislative competence, of course, as we understand, as I understand it, what you have to see in the act of, when is an act of parliament, whether Article 70 read with the list permitted it or not, or whether there is a uh, there is a provision of the constitution which directly confers that power upon the parliament, whether that provision permits it or not. And 
if those provisions do not permit that legislature to legislate on that particular matter, then yes, this is a legislative competence issue, and it is not permissible under Article 184. Gotcha. In, in your opinion, the law is good law, parliament is competent to make the law, and every provision of the law uh, is valid and does not in any way violate any provision of the constitution. So then what happens again, I go back to the full court hearing aid, and you are given a right of appeal under that. So are they not then entitled to their right of appeal in the event that the court decides that this, these petitions are not maintainable, they cannot challenge it? Does that not go to the fact that once again you put it, the burden on the court itself to decide when it wants to constitute a full court and block that right of appeal and when it wants to constitute a smaller bench and allow that right of appeal? And, and whether the act is in field or is it suspended? I, I, it I, is, think, I, it think, uh, I think my illustrious board. colleague has raised a very valid point and I was thinking uh, about it during the break. And if we read the right of appeal, it first of all, it talks about an aggrieved person. Now, I'm trying to envisage a scenario where one would be aggrieved, first scenario. Second thing is we can, and this is permissible, read down legislation. We can, for instance, read into it that wherever there is a full court, needless to say, you cannot have a right of appeal over the full court so that one can read down the legislation that those cases but we are which right have we determined what would have we taken away from someone someone gets an extra right to challenge a judgment if at all it's an irritation to us oh now you have to have the appeal oh now the review jurisdiction has been extended so uh, what are we doing and it's not conferring this power to an executive functionary to, to the legislature to the president or to anybody else. It may be nuisance value for us. Our reviews are going, our appeals are going, that sort of thing. What are we taking away? If the judgment is correct and in order, should we shy away from looking at it because someone files an appeal? Uh, yes, it may uh, bring in litigation into the court. That's the downside may be said. But where is the aggrieved person? Who will be the aggrieved person be? The person affected because I think the 184.3, the whole intendment of that was for, was for not for lawyers. It was not for the well-to-do. It was not for the multinationals. It was for the, the poor, the dejected of society. We have a whole chapter on the principles of policy, which nobody bothers to, uh, we don't read. 